All right, good morning. We'll just uh, stop this one here. Let's all stand, let's pray, and let's worship the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful morning, Lord. Thank you for bringing us all here together to worship you and praise you, Father, and most importantly, Father, to learn more about you. So, Lord, we lift this morning to you, Lord. Uh, go before us, and may your spirit be upon us, Father, as we uh, praise and glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Ready?
Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my head lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing to the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you You go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God Shine in the shadows Win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God Let's stand Almighty Fortress You go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God Shine in the shadows, win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God So when I fight, I fight on my knees With my head lifted high, oh battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing to the night, oh God. The battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Father God, go before us again. The bottle belongs to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Beautiful weather out, isn't it? Enjoy it while we can. I think we're going to get wet later this week. If you have a bulletin, why don't you take it out? We'll go over the announcements together. And our first announcement concerns our Wednesday night prayer and the word happening this Wednesday, the 29th at the home of Frank and Nancy at 7 p.m., and Zoom will be available. The Ladies' Study and Fellowship, you'll be going through Ephesians 6, 1 through 9, this coming Saturday, April 1st. The time is 9 o'clock in the morning. Location there at Don's house. All the information is listed for you there. Outreach at Del Valle Park, also next Saturday at 9 o'clock. Uh, if you're led to serve, be part of that outreach, make sure that you talk to Pastor Jason after the service this morning. Another uh, special event we're having uh, coming up on April 7th is our special Good Friday service. It'll be at 6.30 in the evening, that Friday evening, at the Harvest Haven in Cerritos, the second floor where we used to meet as a church, and there will be a potluck following that special service, so I hope to see many of you there. It'll be a great time. All right, let's pray for the tithes and offerings this morning. Father, we do thank you. Lord, just a beautiful day to come and sit at your feet and to just to take in all that you have for us, God. You've blessed us so much, and we're so, we're so privileged to be part of the family of God. And God, part of our, as part of our worship this morning, we give to you of our tithes and offerings, Lord. Uh, we give cheerfully. We know, Lord, that the things we have, all good gifts, come from our Father above. And so, Lord, we just want to give back a portion to you. We ask you to bless and use these tithes and offerings for the continued preaching of the gospel, not only here, but around the world, Lord, as even Calvary Gateway can reach out as we do in Spain and other places in the world, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity. So give wisdom to those that have the responsibility of these funds. This morning we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. I've. 
tasted and seen all the stars of love where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord there's nothing worth more that will come close no thing can compare your olive in your presence I've tasted and seen of the sweetness of love where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, 
So go before us again this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple things on the announcements as well. Um, the um, Before service, there's a lot of warfare that goes on. You know, a lot of warfare in people's lives, trying to discourage, in your lives, trying to discourage you from coming to church. Maybe even give you an attitude before you even get here that might hinder what God wants to do in fellowship and receiving the word. Um, and how important it is to pray before service. And so there's a small group of people that actually get here at 915. They pray for you guys. They pray for all those who are coming. They pray for it. And I 
it seems like an, a simple thing, but I can't, I'm very thankful often to them and, and acknowledge that because it's a huge thing uh, that goes unnoticed. And so really uh, a lot of warfare is fought and won on your guys' behalf sometimes because of those people that are praying and preparing our hearts to receive. So that's open to anybody if you'd like to be a part of that. Um, and it, no commitment or anything, even if you want to show up once a week or, or for part of the time. Sometimes I'll just set up and then I'll walk in there halfway through. Like I, I was able to this morning and just pray with them for a little bit. Um, but a very fruitful, effective ministry. So if you're able to, I want to extend that invitation to be a part of that in whatever capacity you so feel led to do. To do. All right, with that, we are in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. If you guys want to turn there, we're going to be picking up in verse 28. So as you guys turn there, let's have a word of prayer. All right, get that going there. So, Father, we do thank you again for your goodness, and we do just commit this time to you. Thank you for the time of worship. Thank you for the time of prayer here. Thank you for the time of fellowship, just a place to come. And we're here for you, Lord. And so I do, I do pray that that's a reality, that we are here for you. We're here to receive from you. And so, Lord, we just pray you have your way today. You know where every single person is in this room. Some are discouraged, confused. Some are faint-hearted. Some are doing great. Uh, there's just, everyone's in a different season. Maybe there's even compromise in here. And Lord, you want to meet each person where they're at, and you want to speak to them. And you want to encourage some, exhort others, uh, even confront maybe and direct others. Uh, but Lord, have your way. I just pray that we would sit here today and say, God, whatever you want to say, just speak it. Give us understanding. Open up your word to us. Bring health to our lives. Uh, that we would better understand you and know how you want us to live. So we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are in a section here. We're going a little bit slower here in Ephesians. Uh, Galatians was six chapters. We did it in, I think, eight weeks. Um, that's my intention even as we go into Philippians and Colossians. There are four chapters each. We'll probably cover them in four to six weeks at the most each. Um, so we'll go at a pretty good pace. But Ephesians... Um, we're going a little bit slower. Um, we've been covering about a half a chapter a week until we got to four, and now we've really slowed it down. Kind of part of that is I've studied Ephesians a lot, and so there's a, a lot of familiarity and things I don't want to skip over because I think they're so rich. And two, we're really in a spot here at Ephesians that's very practical in how we're to live our lives. Um, this section is specifically talks about, opens up um, a lot of issues that we deal with pretty much throughout the course of our day on a daily basis. And so I think it's really important that we take a little bit of time and understand what's being shared here. And so the principle that was stated here in chapter 4, verse 22 to 24, it says this, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And so put off who you used to be, how you used to behave, and put on who you are now, the behavior of the new man. Over and over in Ephesians, many times Paul has told us what we were like before we got saved and why we were that way. And then he tells us how we are now, now that we have a relationship with the Lord. And now he's saying, hey, stop behaving like you were before. You don't need to do that anymore. Before, you didn't really have a choice. You behave that way because that's who you were. But now you're different. If you've received Jesus, you are a different person. You're a new creation. You're filled with his spirit. You're a child of God. That's what the Bible tells us. And so now he says, now, now you get to behave like that. And let me teach you how. And so then in verses 25 to 32 here, he gives a bunch of examples of how you used to be before you knew the Lord, and now how we should be now that we know the Lord. And this whole section is kind of then sandwiched in chapter 5, verse 1. Remember, in the original letter that uh, Paul wrote, there weren't chapter breaks and verses. It was one fluid letter that he wrote. And so at the end of this section, it goes into chapter 5, and it says, therefore, he kind of sandwiches it in here, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. So again, that's always where we have to remember. We're not doing these things to be children of God or to become Christians. 
you got to talk right. you got to speak the truth. You can't lie. You have to do these things to be children. He says, no, because you are children, now behave like who you are. And so, again, we get to behave this way now, a healthy way, a way that pleases God. We don't have to behave like we were before we knew the Lord. So with that, already we've seen here in verse 25 that God is a God of truth. And so we, being his children, should stop lying and be people that speak truth and live in truth as well. Then we learned uh, in the next few verses that God only allows his will to dictate his behavior. God has emotions, too. It speaks many times of the emotions of God, how he gets angry and and sad and grieved. We're going to see a portion of that in just a few verses here. But he doesn't let his emotions dictate his behavior. And so we are to do the same. We learned that emotions were given to us by God to add dimension and fullness to life, but we're not to live for emotions or by emotions. We're to only allow our will to dictate how we think, speak, and behave. And so last week we looked at anger, which was, is one of the strongest emotions we have, and one of the strongest emotions we use to justify unbiblical behavior. If I get angry, in in a sense, I'm justified in doing speaking or acting however I want to. You took me there. You brought me there. And so we see this some sort of justification. But we learned that, no, um, emotions, we should get angry at times. We're commanded, be angry, but do not sin. You still have control over your thoughts, words, and actions, no matter how you feel. God has given that to you. He's empowered you with his Holy Spirit, and you have control over your emotions. You're not to be controlled by them. So the put off and put on there isn't, uh, it, it, well, what it is is put off no control over your emotions and be under control. Put your emotion, emotions under their control. So that's the put off and the put on. And now we're going to pick up here with verse 28. And we're going to cover 28 to 30 today. So 28 says, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So we're to put off stealing, and we're to put on giving. So we, again, carry this theme through about the nature of God. We're his children. We're new creation. So God is sacrificial, gracious giver. That's his nature. Excuse me. He gives love, salvation, power, a future in heaven. He gives so many good gifts. This whole book started with, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Chapter 1, verse 3, God gives us so many wonderful things. And so he's in us. We have his nature now. And so we should move from being takers to being givers in life. So some of you, now that Greek word there for stealing is klepto. So we see where we get that word kleptomaniac. Um, The word just means the word is klepto. It means to take away by stealth or to steal, to take something that does not belong to you. So some of you might tune out at this time like, well, I don't have a problem with that, right? <clears throat> Emotions, I could see. Truth is important. Um, but I, I admit, maybe you never have a problem with stealing things. Maybe a few of you do, did, and maybe some of you do. I don't know. I think even myself this week, I, don't, I never really had, even before I got saved, I'd steal things sometimes, but I never had a real problem with it where I would steal material goods that often. Um, And so you might tune out, but I think there's a larger principle here. Um, I think overall, there's things that we could take from other people that don't belong to us outside of material objects. Uh, We could take time, attention, glory. There's a lot of things that we could take that don't belong to us. And I think those things are more relevant to us as believers, perhaps. You might be sitting here, especially as a Christian, saying, like, I don't steal things necessarily, But there are things that we have a temptation we might take that don't belong to us. And so we'll see that application as we go through here a little bit later on. But I think the primary, again, application here um, is material objects. That's what he's referring. But the overall principle is move from being a taker to a giver. And so, again, we'll see that as we go through. And so we kind of start, what's the heart that produces someone who takes something from other people. As we look at that, we see uh, when we take things that belong to others, it, it shows selfishness, greed, and really a lack of faith. That shouldn't surprise us as we look at the world. The world does take things that don't belong to them. We learned that 
through Ephesians is it talks about how we used to be. We were dead. We were without God. We had no hope. We lived for self. Even that survey I referenced last week, it talked about how 90% of our nation essentially lives uh, for the God of self. And so they will justify all behavior based on emotions to be happy all for self. And so it shouldn't surprise us that they take things that don't belong to them. If it makes me happy, if it makes me feel good, if it uh, accomplishes something that serves me, it's okay to take things that don't belong to me. But selfishness, as you start with that, selfishness is just self-love. And remember what love is. We're going to run into that a few times through these next few chapters. Love just means being fully committed or consumed with something. And so we're to be fully committed to God and others, right? And so a self-love is that I'm committed to myself or consumed with me more than God and others. And so a self-love just means being consumed with yourself. Remember, the great commandment is to love God and others. The greatest obstacle to that command is I love myself by nature from birth more than God and others. And so that's the battle as I become a Christian is to turn that preoccupation with me to thinking of God and others before myself. And that's really, I think, where we become happiest as well. Not that we're doing it to be happy, but it produces true joy and purpose in life, and we find that that's what we're created to do. And so taking from others is saying, I love me more than you. I'm more important than you are. We can justify it any way we want. Nobody will know it's gone. They got plenty, whatever it is. But the basis is, I'm more important than you are, so I'm going to take what doesn't belong to me. And so we also see here that greed is kind of the underlying term there. And it's desiring, the definition of greed really is desiring more than God has given to us. And so God has chosen not to give us something, and so we um, want more than he has, he has laid out for us. The basis really of greed is a lack of understanding the sovereignty, the love of God, and his involvement in our life. We have to understand that God is in total control, he's all-powerful, and he loves us. And so if we understand that, that brings contentment to our life. Paul says in Philippians 4.11, he says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. So we see that it didn't come naturally for Paul either. He had to learn to be content in whatever season he was in. And so contentment says this, not only says, but believes that I have what I have because God has given it to me. I don't have what I don't have because God has chosen not to give it to me. And that's something it sounds like, yeah, no, duh, but really think about that and live that out in every area of your life is I have what I have because God has given it to me. And the things I don't have is because God has chosen not to give it to me. And I had to really come to grips and be settled with that that I, then I become content with the things that I do have. We look at every area of life, relationships, finances, possessions, position. Our job is to stay close to the Lord and be in his will, and then trust him to give us what he wants and doesn't want to give. Then we look at the things we do have, we value them more, because we realize that that's been given to me by God. Now I turn my attention on being a good steward of what God has given to me. Sometimes people are so bent out of shape about what they don't have, they fail to properly steward the things that they do have. And so what has God given you? Value it and steward it the way God tells you to in his word. Because God essentially says, this is how much time you have in a day. This is what I'm going to give you. If you steward it the way I tell you, that should fill up your whole day. But if you're taking time out of your day to to, to daydream and think and desire and strive for things you don't have and I haven't given you, then you're wasting time in stewarding what I have given to you. You could do a better job in ministering to the things that I've already given to you. So what's the cure for both these things, self-love and greed in relationship to others? It goes back to where this whole section began in chapter 4, verse 1, which is that that we have a focus on the Lord, right? If you go back to that, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. That points back to the previous three chapters that tells us who God is and what he's done and all that we have in the Lord, what he's accomplished in salvation and our new nature and all these things. And so as I turn my focus back to the Lord, then that puts my interpersonal relationships and the, th- and the way I look at people in a different way. So, We look at others either two ways. 
I either look at them first after looking at me, which will typically breed jealousy, competition, envy, strife. I see them as competition. I want what they have or I'm competing against them. Or I look at the Lord first and then I look at them. After I've looked at the Lord first, then I, I receive what I need from him. The thing, I put life in its right perspective. I see what he's given me and not given me. I'm content. Now I look at other people and I see them as opportunities to minister to them, to give to them, to sacrifice for them. So if any time I'm being selfish, it's just an indicator. I must be looking at me before I look at them. Now I'm looking to really take from them or compete with them or be jealous or covetous with them instead of, I want to bless, I want to serve, I want to give to you. So again, as we look at God first, we're satisfied, content, ministered to, and now I'm free to pour on others. But if I fail to do that, it's one or the other. I look at myself and I want to take from them instead of give to them. And so that is kind of the underlying truth for inter interpersonal relationships. So when I'm loving the Lord and others, living and meditating on all his promises and what he's given to me, when I'm experiencing contentment, then I won't steal. I won't take. I'll actually be the opposite. I'll be a giver to them. But see, not stealing is just half the battle. And again, a lot of times we'll look at this list, don't lie, don't steal, and we'll look at the things I shouldn't do, and we think, I've obeyed the Lord. But this is just half of a process of being conformed to the image of Christ. I put off the old man, but i got to put something on in its place. And so now we're to put on the behavior of the new man. And so what are we to put on now in the Lord? We're to labor and be givers, right? And that's the rest of that verse, to labor. And so as we read that again, it says, Let him who stole steal no longer. Put off stealing. What should you do but... Rather, let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may give, have something to give him who has need. So we have to put that on. And so we labor, and the word labor there means toil to ex exhaustion. Not just work, but we should be hard workers. And not just that, we don't just do that, but we do it at what is good. The word good there is of good constitution or nature, useful, um, good, and pleasant. So again, we work, we work at what is good, we work hard at it, and notice this, not just to provide for your own needs, but to be able to give to that person who is in need. And so now we transition to being givers, not just providing for ourselves. And so we look at that, and what a great transformation, really, that brings glory to God. From people that used to be takers because of selfishness, greed, laziness, to now people that work really hard and want to help others that are in need. Those are the types of transformations that bring glory to God. And that's really what he wants to make each of us of what we used to be. And I, I've been thinking about that this week, too. And I think all of us need to change in all these areas, right? Uh, we, about lying and speaking truth and uh, controlling our emotions, you know, not being led by our emotions, but being led by God's word and his Holy Spirit, um, not being takers, but givers. But I think the areas that maybe you struggle with to a greater degree before you came to the Lord, the Lord wants to almost redeem those to the, de to the degree you got into the flesh. He wants to do that degree in the spirit. That's why in some areas you might be more sensitive and really try and walk tighter with the Lord and further to an extreme because you don't want to have anything to do with how given over to that area of your flesh you used to be. And I think as we do that, boy, it brings a great testimony. I know there's people that I've known that, that I knew before, and then watching what they've become is just like, man, that's just the Lord. Like, that was your, your biggest problem in the flesh, and now you're the, first, the opposite of that right now. One guy I thought of, I mean, I, I think of a lot of people, but the guy that came here a few weeks ago, uh, Pastor Jesse Colon, our missionary uh, to uh, Mexico, and um, he used to be a used car salesman, right? And he, he was really good with his, with his words. He was a smooth talker. And, and I don't want to offend anybody, but when I think of used car salesman, I think of like the shyster, right? The guy that's trying to pull one over on you. So if you're one in here, no offense. He was one after he got saved too. They're not all like that. But he told me flat out he used to be one. I mean, and a shyster. Before he got saved, he was a smooth talker, and he was trying to get people even into things they didn't need, and so, um, uh, and so that's how, who he was. Then he got saved, and now the Lord has used 
that ability to communicate and stuff, to really share now the gospel, to be very bold in sharing his faith, to go places that a lot of other people would not go uh, just because that's hardwired in him. And so the thing that God, the natural ability that God gave him, he gave it over to the flesh and used it for corruption. When he got saved, the Lord redeemed that same quality and now is using it for his glory to the opposite extreme. God wants to do that with each of you. You each have like gifts and abilities that, that God has given to you, some natural, some spiritual. But before you came to the Lord, you were cut a certain way. And not all that was bad. Maybe you're a good talker. Maybe you're a very good listener. Maybe you're a hard worker. But maybe you use those things for selfish gain before the Lord. And the Lord wants to now take that and redeem that same thing and now use it for his glory in his kingdom. And so he gets glory when he does those things. And so, again, being transformed from a taker to a giver. But, again, I think the principle here is wider than just taking material objects. Overall, just being a giver instead of a taker. And, again, as I mentioned earlier, we can steal things, take things other than material objects, time, attention, glory. So even as Christians, when I'm selfish or self-focused, anybody ever do that sometimes even as a believer? Yeah, Miguel does. Nobody else. That's cool. <laughs> Um, sometimes when we're self-focused, sometimes when we're greedy, we're not content with what we have. We have a lack of faith. We're not meditating and believing on God's promises, which we all um, do that at times. And so we fall into those areas here. Then we can steal in areas from God and other people. And so let's look at that just for a second here. I could steal time and attention from people. Being selfish, I can become oblivious to other people's needs whatever's going on in their lives. I'm only concerned about myself. Have you ever been caught there? I know I have. The Lord's caught me while I talk to people, and I realize, man, I wasn't even thinking of them. I wasn't even interested in where they were at. I was all consumed with where I was. I was being very self-focused, and I was really monopolizing the conversation and our time together. Again, we want time and attention from other people. Um, I want them to go out of their way to help me. Sometimes when people aren't there the way I expect them to do. I can get all hurt and like they weren't there for me. They, who knows what was going on in their lives? Maybe they were going through a trial. Maybe they were distracted and I was completely oblivious and I was just focused on, well, what about me? So again, sometimes we got to get out of ourselves or all the time we got to get out of ourselves. Let the Lord minister to us and bring people at the right time to encourage us. But our focus should be on the Lord and then what's going on with other people? I want to give them my attention. I want to give them my time. It belongs to them, and I want to make sure I'm giving them their due. Again, sometimes we can monopolize conversations, always wanting to talk about ourselves and what we're going through. Um, I always want to make it about me. Again, that's a form of stealing. And, and I've done that before. I'll go through seasons, and I'll reflect on conversations, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, all I did was I, I, me, me in that conversation, and I wasn't even, again, asking about them and following up. Then I realized, oh my gosh, they told me about this thing a week ago, and I didn't even ask them about it, you know? And so, again, that we could be sometimes so self-consumed that we steal. We take what doesn't belong to us. We take their time, attention away from, from where it should be. Again, we don't want to fall too far off the other side of the horse here, God has put us in a body to minister to one another, to comfort and encourage. And there's times or seasons in our life where we need that time and attention and encouragement. Sometimes we're going through something and we don't want, I, sometimes we fall the other way. Where we're like, no, I don't want to burden them with it. I, I, I can handle it. But God has put the body in our lives sometimes where we do need to open up with certain people and get encouragement and prayer and ministry. Sometimes we're too proud for that. Sometimes we don't want to bother people with that. Um, and so there's a balance there. When it's needed, hey, I need, I, I do need to talk. I am concerned about you. I do want to focus on you, but I also want to open up and share something that maybe I need some counsel, some encouragement, some prayer from you. And so, again, we're in a body where that goes both ways. And so, again, we want to be open to give and to receive. Galatians 6 says, bear, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so we want to be good uh, burden bearers with one another. Another area we could steal is God's glory. Again, maybe we crave attention and acceptance. We all do. Our flesh does, I should say. Always wants to be the center of attention. Always wants people to ask about us and think about us, right? In our minds, all everybody ever thinks about is us, right? Uh, they're probably thinking about me. They said that probably because they knew what I'm going, and they're probably meaning this. And it's always about 
us and everything, I think we're shocked to realize that, boy, they think about me about as much as I think about them, you know, and sometimes that's sad. Um, again, as we focus on really thinking and encouraging and focusing on others for that end, um, I think we find uh, contentment there. So again, we might want people's attention, appro approval, and praise, again, as the flesh does, but all that belongs to the Lord. So we need to be people that first give our attention to the Lord, praise Him, and then we seek to point other people to the Lord. So we point ourselves to Him all the time, and then we want to point other people to Him all the time as well, just keeping the focus on Him. So again, the overall principle here is to move from being a selfish taker to a self-sacrificing giver, bringing glory to God and ministering to others. Next, verse 29, now we switch to biblical communication. It says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. This is a scripture that God gave me years ago. It's kind of almost a life verse to always filter my communication through that and what biblical communication should be. We look at even these topics that the Holy Spirit through Paul picked. We could go through this pretty quick, you know, and just say, hey, you know, stop lying and speak truth. You know, there's a place for anger, but don't let your emotions control you. And, and we can move quickly through here, but I think these were selected by the Holy Spirit through Paul because they pretty much categorize some of the major issues in our life about how the place of emotions in our life, uh, the place of truth in our life, the place of being a giver and a taker, the heart behind that, the place of communication. These are all areas that we deal with consistently all day long, every day. And so here, there's kind of a summary of how we should behave and think about each of these areas in our lives. Then in a few weeks, probably because uh, we're coming into Easter services here, but when we get to the end of the chapter, we're going to even deal with interpersonal relationships with biblical forgiveness and reconciliation, um, which is very healthy to go through and shows us, you know, when we have to separate from people or the nature of our relationships and what forgiveness, what it looks like, what we're required to do. We're always required to forgive, but we don't reconcile until there's repentance on the, on the part of the believer, or the, the sinner, I should say. Um, and sometimes we switch those. Sometimes we fail to forgive, um, and we reconcile with people that haven't repented because we get those things confused. So it's good for us to know in the nature of interpersonal relationships, the nature of my interactions with others, of how, how I need to forgive and what that looks like because I'm commanded to, but also what hinders reconciliation and how I should approach reconciling with an individual. So now we get into communication. The tongue is dealt with a great deal in the word. The book of James is known as kind of practically how to live out your faith, the, book, the small epistle of James. Every chapter deals with the tongue. And chapter 3, the very middle of the book, is all about the tongue in our speech. And so it's one of the easiest areas to sin takes very little effort, right? We could just sit there and exert very little energy and just lie and be malicious and spread gossip and say all kinds of hurtful and harmful things, things that don't glorify God or minister to other people. So it has to be dealt with a lot. It takes, again, little effort. The old man used the tongue for selfish reasons, but the new man is not to use his tongue or our tongue that way. So the, the put-off here is corrupt communication. Now, this, this isn't just about profanity, uh, off-color jokes, or inappropriate jokes, or anything. This is talking about anything that tears down. The word corrupt there means rotten, putrefied, corrupted by one, and no longer fit for use, worn out. And so this is talking about things that corrode or corrupt. So we could say things that eat away at other people. So instead of building people up, we're tearing them down. So again, it has a lot more to do with just bad language. We can tear people down many different ways. And so we look at scripture and some of the scriptures, some of the things we're not to do. We'll look at the positives in just a moment, what we're to put on. But kind of the opposite of that is we shouldn't gossip. That, that's one of the ones that is easiest to do, that many of us do. We share things about other people that we have no business sharing. If we have an issue with other people, we should go talk to them directly, not share it with other people. And so gossiping is an, is an area that 
we shouldn't be in. The Bible is clear in many places, slandering people, being malicious, lying, being bitter, abusive, speaking too much, flattery. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with recognizing something that the Lord is really doing in someone's. I, fa- I think we fail to encourage each other enough in what God is doing. And so we should be looking for positive things that God is doing and, and acknowledging that to lift up and edify one another. But then there's flattery, which is just a form of manipulation. I'm telling you something to puff you up, to get a better standing with you, to manipulate you to do what I want. And so scripture's clear. There's no place. There's a difference between encouragement and empty flattery. So we're to put all this off, and instead we're to put on what is good, necessary, and that imparts grace to the hearer. And so that essentially means to give them what they don't deserve. So the general principle, what is good then? We're to say only what is good and what is necessary for the moment. The general principle behind speech, the Bible tells us, is it is an indicator of the heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks, the scriptures tell us. And so it, it should be coming from the place of our will. The Bible tells us that we're to love God and others with our, from our heart, with our will. We choose to love God uh, and others. And so our speech should be a reflection of that. Our, our speech should honor God and minister and edify other people. It should be an aid in their walk and relationship with the Lord. If, it, if they're an unbeliever, then it should be a source of grace so that it points them to Jesus. Maybe we're not always sharing the gospel with them every time we see them, but it should be rightly representative and it should be a good testimony and a witness, the things that we speak of, of the Lord. It should make them thirst and desire God um, the way that we speak and interact. And our speech should also glorify the Lord. And for other believers, our speech should be an aid in their growth in their walk with the Lord. And so that's the purpose, really, uh, Scripture that tells us as far as our peace, our, our, our speech. So some specific areas here. These are specific things that Scripture tells us as far as what we should put on and how we should communicate. So we learned a few weeks ago, one, that we should speak truth and not lie. And so no form of lying, no partial truths, that our tongue should be reserved as the new man to speak truth. We should desire truth in our heart, in our will. We should saturate ourselves with truth of God's word, meditating on his word and on him. So our out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we should be desiring to speak, actively speak truth with other people. Next, we see we should be speaking God's word, and we should be giving his word instead of our opinions necessarily when we counsel or minister to other people. Again, we should be consumed with his word and his perspective and then giving that to other people as we converse. We should be giving his promises. We should be giving his hope and his encouragement. A few scriptures with this. Um, Colossians, if you want to go Colossians 3.16, tells us, tells us this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So again, just starting there, um, that's a good it, does, it, does the word of God dwell, reside richly in you? Sometimes he visits poorly, right? Maybe sometimes we'll read a few scriptures, we, we look at a few verses, but does the word of God reside, dwell, permanent residence, richly, abundantly within you? So again, are we people that put the word of God into our lives constantly? So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, and then we te- in teaching and, admoni- and admonitioning one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Another verse we see is 1 Thessalonians 5.14. In our ministry to others, he says, Now I exhort you, brethren, to warn those who are unruly. We'll come back to that in a moment. But comfort the faint-hearted. That word comfort there is a compound word, and it means to speak alongside. And so when when someone is faint-hearted, they're being beat down by trials or discouragement, that's what faint-hearted is. We come alongside and we speak to them. Now, we don't just say, like, these empty platitudes that we often get in the world, everything's going to be okay, it'll all work out. Whenever anybody gives me that, I'm like, how do you know? Like, where where are you getting That, that? That's meaningless to me right now. But when you come alongside and you speak the truths of God that supersede the natural world we live in, 
These are the truths of God that we speak. So when we come alongside to encourage one another, we speak the truth of God's word to them, and that's what undergirds and strengthens those that are discouraged and being beat down in the world. Uh, 2 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3.16, this is a very well-known verse. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Why wouldn't we want to share that with others? This is, the word of God is what brings completeness and maturity. So this is what we should be sharing with other people primarily. We, it should dwell richly within us. Now we take it and we share it with others. That's the thing, a, a primary thing that should influence our speech. I, th I think also with Nehemiah chapter 4, they're going through a lot of spiritual warfare, and all the attacks of the enemy were geared on getting their eyes off of the Lord and getting them on themselves. You're too weak. You don't have the right resources. You don't know what you're doing. That was the attack that they were throwing at uh, the people that were rebuilding the wall. They were trash talking and trying to get their eyes on themselves and their limitations and weakness, and it started to work. So Nehemiah had to come, and he had to remind them and speak truth. He goes, those are, those are true, but not all true. You are too weak. You're re you don't have the resources. You don't know what you're doing. None of you are contractors or builders, but he's missing a big piece. God, This is God's work. So God has all the strength that you need. God, You don't know what you're doing, but God does. You don't have the right resources, but God does. Hey, God made the whole universe out of nothing. We, we're giving him burnt rocks and, and wood. What, can, he, can you imagine what he's going to do with that? So again, God has the resources, and so they spoke the full truth to them to bring encouragement and strength. And again, that's what we need to do. Out in the world, we're getting lied at and beat down. The enemy's whispering in our ear saying, you're too weak, you don't know what you're doing, you're not strong enough. And there's truth to that, but that's only part of the truth. And so we need to encourage one another with the full truth of God's word as we walk in this, in this world. And so again, that's the purpose of our tongue, to speak, speak the word to one another. The next chapter in Ephesians that we're going to get to, another thing that we see is for those that are submitted to the Holy Spirit, then it produces certain things. And so in chapter 5, um, verse 18, it says, Don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled or ongoingly under the control of the Holy Spirit. And then what happens when we are, verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When, we, when we're under the control of the Holy Spirit, we're declaring the greatness and the good things of the, of the Lord. And so we are speaking of the things of God to other people. Another thing that we see as far as the use of our tongues, what we should share is part of building up, speaking what edifies, sometimes we have to address sin in flesh. Some people will point to this, and uh, that's the verse that says, you know, build one another up. Don't tear one another down. And so when you try and point out sin, hey, man, you're not edifying me. You're not building me up. No, I am. That's part of building up. Because if you're in sin or there's a hindrance, you're not growing. And we need to address that before you can continue to grow. And sometimes, and that's throughout Scripture, we're called out of love and humility to approach people about compromise and sin in their life so that they could remove that and see growth in their lives. And so, again, we see that the verse I referenced earlier, 1 Thessalonians 5.14, it says, warn the unruly. The word unruly means out of bounds, so someone who is in sin or compromise. It says, warn them. That word, word warn is no fail. And that, the, the, the way it's used in Scripture is there's a problem, so you confront that person about the problem in order to bring change to their life. That's how it's consistently used through Scripture. We see many examples in Matthew 18 and Galatians chapter 6. You, if anyone's in sin, you are spiritual. Seek to restore that person. And so, again, we don't confront them to beat them up. We confront them out of love to bring change so that they're walking in alignment with the Lord. And that's part sometimes of loving and edification. And so we have to be prepared with the right heart to do that. A scripture along those lines as well, not only Galatians 6 and 1 Thessalonians, but in 2 Timothy 2, I'll read that to you guys, 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25. It says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. 
if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. And so again, we need to speak truth, sometimes confront to bring change, but always with a purpose of heart, of gentleness, and love. Another thing our tongue is used for is to be thankful. Chapter 5, as I mentioned, being under the control of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 5, we already looked at verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But verse 20 then, giving thanks always for all things to God. And so when we're under the control of the Holy Spirit, it should produce thankfulness in our speech and thanking God and having a right perspective. We learned last week as well that we should speak with control over our emotions, not from emotions. And so that's another thing. Our tongue, our speech should not be driven by emotions and justified to speak however we want because we're emotional. We should speak, again, under the con- having our emotions under control. Another por- important part of communication is knowing when not to talk. Proverbs 10, 19 says, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. And sometimes I know some, some people that, man, they, they talk too much. Sometimes they're talking and, man, they're saying, Edif- that's an edifying, that's an insightful thing. But then they keep going. <laughs> and it's like, well, that, well, that wasn't good. And, oh, man, you need to just stop right now. And so um, it's a, there's no filter there. there it's just a, a hodgepodge of information. And so, again, uh, use our words, but use them um, economically. Make sure that we're using our tongue the way it's supposed to be used. Another thing is we have a tendency to speak before we have all the details. Uh, this is a huge thing. We need to learn the discipline of suspending judgment until we have all the facts. And sometimes we, um, we skip this one a lot, right? We'll give our opinions because, we'll, well, he said that, and I'm, I'm sure he meant this or she meant that, and it probably be related to this. And so we, we import our thinking in there and make it a reality, and we start giving our opinion about the matter. And the Bible says don't do that. Proverbs 18 says we're to hear both sides of a matter before we make a decision or render a judgment. Proverbs 13, 10 talks about gathering all the, the facts instead of opinions. And so we need to make sure. And there's times in my life where I'm still suspending judgment because I've only heard one side of the story and I haven't heard the other. And so, well, biblically, I'm required to suspend judgment till I have heard from both parties or had them inter- interact with one another. Um, And so that's something that Scripture tells us to do. We have to guard ourselves from that. So in summing this whole section up, we remember that we're children of God, filled with His Spirit, given a new nature, uh, empowered to be like the Father. And so we look at these verses, so He is truth, so why are we lying? If we're filled with His Spirit, we're His children, empowered by Him, we should be truth like He is. He is in a total control of himself. He's the God of the universe. He holds all those things. He only lets his will dictate his behavior. So why are we being controlled by our emotions? He's a sacrificial giver, full of love and grace. Why are we takers? All he wants to do is build us up, give us promises of a hope and a future. Why are we tearing each other down, fostering fear instead of faith in one another, and exploiting weaknesses instead of strengths? And sometimes we do that as well with our tongue, is we will exploit each other's weaknesses. Um, and that's some, something I've been hearing a lot about, too, is some people elevate themselves by tearing each other, other people around them down. And so they may not necessarily rise because of character and service to the Lord, but they tear each other down so it gives the perception that they're higher than they should be. And so that's a, that's a cheap way of, of being a leader or um, uh, growing in your faith. So you put all those together, and it brings us to verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That should bring us back to the beginning of the chapter, chapter 1. Remember, it tells us the work of the Trinity and our salvation, how the Father chose us, the Son redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit sealed us until the redemption of the purchased possession. So now here, using that same language, he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed um, for the day of redemption. And so, interesting, that word grieve means to sorrow, uh, the effect with sadness, it causes grief, Um, and it's used in Scripture elsewhere to speak of those that are going through intense trials and how they're extremely sorrowful or grievous, Uh, dealing with negative consequences of their sin and how now they're 
they're grieved or intensely sorrowful over those. So this is an, an intense word of intense grief and sorrow. And so isn't this an interesting thing that we could cause God intense sorrow, that we can make him very grieved? And so that brings up the question of how can we do that? It says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed. And so I think it's, it's some people, was it verse 29 is it related to? Is it verse 31? It's this whole section here. It starts back up here with putting off, again, God went to such great lengths. He loved you so much. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were enemies of God. You were without hope in this world that it has told us in uh, the earlier chapters. Then God came. We didn't deserve it. He took our place at suffering. Everything that caused all those things in our life, he took upon himself, and he paid the penalty. More than just to forgive you, but also to make you a new creation, to make you his very child, to fill you with his Holy Spirit, to give you the ability to live the way he designed you to live. And so when we choose to say, like, nah, I'm going to live like I used to live. I'm going to lie. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to steal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear people down. I'm going to gossip and be malicious. That's when we act like the old self instead of the new self. The Bible here just tells us we it cause intense sorrow to the Holy Spirit. And so that, that alone, if you love the Lord, should prick your heart. That alone should be the motivation of like, I don't want to grieve God. He's loved me so much. He's done so much for me. I want to live in a way that does not cause him sorrow. Quite the opposite. I want to bring him joy, and I want to bless him for all that he's done for me. And so that should be a sober ending as well as far as a motivation. We don't do this stuff because... You know, quit lying or you can't come to this church anymore. You know, you're not a good Christian. You're not going to get to heaven. It's like, man, if you've received Jesus, you're going to heaven. You're his son. You're his daughter. And so, again, let's not do things that hurt the one who did so much for us. Let's do the things that he's enabled and filled us to do to please and bring him joy. And, again, we are enabled to do that. And, again, that should be our main motivation. Amen? And that's a good way to start communion as we now reflect on all that he's done, and now we're going to remember that. That's the point of communion, is to remember, to remember what Jesus did and made everything I just shared with you, and much more, all that was made possible because of what Jesus did on the cross. We do this once a month. Don't let it become routine. Don't let it become unvaluable. Take some time. We're going to sing a song right now. Take some time to really think about all that the Lord has done. Reflect upon him and his word. Worship him. Focus on him. And then I'm going to come up, have the elements. I'm going to come back up, and we're going to talk about the bread and the juice real quick. And think about what it means and remember it as we partake and worship the Lord. This is a form of worship to him. All right. So let's, let's worship the Lord, and then I'll, I'll come back up and we'll share a wretch, I remember who I was, I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time, sin separated, the breach was far too wide, but from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side, so you made a way. Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside And there at the cross You paid a debt I owe Broke my chain, freed my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious You took 
my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you all cried out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. me from the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that calls the sons and daughters we were ransomed by a father through the blood, the blood. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood. The cause of sons and daughters, we are ransomed by a father through the Washed be white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Glory to Glory to His name, there to my heart was the blood of Glory to His name. All right. And, uh, you know, Paul talking about communion, he just reminds the church at Corinth, he says, take, eat, this is my um, body which is broken for you to do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so again, the focus here as we partake is the Lord and what the Lord had done. And so um, let's pray. One, I want to share the gospel again. And I, I don't know, I'm assuming everybody here is saved, but I don't want to take that for granted. Maybe even someone's watching online. I, I never want to partake of communion without giving everybody an opportunity to get right with the Lord. And so let's start with that. And then also then a prayer for the bread, for those that do believe on what that bread represents. So Father, we do come to you. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Again, we saw today you went to such great lengths to make us right with you. Lord, we were all your enemies. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Lord, when we were your enemies in a fallen, rebellious state, you came after us. You gave us what we didn't deserve. You gave us grace. And you took our place that we could never, we paid a price we could never pay for the whole world, for all people that ever lived, all the penalty was put on you, and you took the place. You took the punishment. You were separated from God the Father on our behalf. That's why you cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so, Lord, if, the Bible says if we confess you as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised you from the dead, we will be saved. So, Lord, you took our place, then you rose from the dead, 
to prove that your sacrifice was accepted, that death no longer had any hold or right to you. It had to release you. It showed that the payment was paid in full. As you said to Telestai, paid in full at the end. And so, Lord, for anybody that's never received that or has walked away from that, Lord, it's, it's simple. As we just know we're sinners, we're separated from you, but that you came and you took our place, you paid the penalty to not only forgive us, but to reconcile us with you, to make us your children, to fill us with your spirit. We want that, Lord. So I just pray anybody that hasn't received here or online or anywhere hearing this, that right now they would just ask that, ask you to forgive, acknowledge that Jesus, you did die and you rose again for them personally, to forgive, to cleanse, to reconcile them. So Lord, we thank you. And Lord, for those of us that have received that, we're here to remember that today. That gospel I just shared is summed up in this bread and this juice. And this is just a, a reminder that we're to do often to remember, to keep us in a place of worshiping you, of thankfulness, of brokenness, of submission to you, Lord. And so, Lord, the body that was broken for us, Lord, Lord, that you came as a man, you lived a sinless life, then you went and offered yourself on the cross on our behalf, and so now, Lord, as we take, really, a, a loaf was broken, and each person was given a piece. And so we each take a piece that makes a whole. And now we're your body. You are our head. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would bless this to us now as we remember you, we worship you, we thank you for the sacrifice that you gave, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, we just now take this cup as well of this juice. This represents your blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There's no taking away of sin. And so the life is in the blood, the scripture says. And so that's why you had to die. Because our death would not satisfy our sin, what we did. Lord, it, that would just be justice, Lord, that we, our life would be taken for all the wrong and sin that we've done. But you were innocent, you were sinless, you are God, and so you shed your blood to pay for everyone. And so, Lord, we hold this cup up, and Lord, one, it speaks of your love, and it speaks of your forgiveness. You have given this to us, that we would be good receivers, that as we partake, we'll remember that we're forgiven of all sins, and we see the ultimate example of self-sacrificing love on the cross, that we would receive that, Lord, unconditional love. But also, Lord, that, that then we're called to do the same. We're called to forgive and we're called to love. That that would be a, a reminder to us to love and forgive as you have done to us. Fill us now with your spirit. The love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given. And we are commanded to forgive as God through Christ has forgiven us. So one, we receive and we worship you. And two, now we're free to love and forgive others. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, Lord, now we just commit the rest of this day to you. I pray we wouldn't be forgetful hearers, but that we would be doers. And, Lord, we would think often that we are your children. We'd worship you for all that you've done. And, Lord, that we would be setting our mind, Lord, at submitting to your spirit that would affect the way we speak, the way we think, the way we behave, Lord, that we would let you live through us, Lord. And, Lord, if we do that, that solves everything because you are God of truth. You are a God that builds up in communication. You're a God that's under the control of your emotions. You're a God who gives and doesn't take. So as we submit to the Spirit of God in us, then, Lord, we would see the fruit of that in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, why don't we go ahead and stand, and we'll sing one more song. All right, let's all <clears throat> let's sing this old Calvary song. I can't believe it's been 20 years already. So...
God bless you guys. Have a blessed Sunday.